Welcome, everyone. This is effectively episode one of season two of the Academy of Management Review Origin series, the podcast and video series in which we look at how conceptual and theory papers are, are initially um, born, how they evolve, and how they come to be published in the Academy of Management Review. My name is Greg Fisher, and I'm going to be hosting this series for the, se for the second season. And uh, today I'm joined by Stuart Clegg and uh, Marco Berti, who are going to be talking about their paper called Research Movements and Theorizing Dynamics in Management and Organization Studies, a fascinating paper that really looks at many of the meta processes that are associated with both theorizing and the sustaining and sort of ongoing development of certain theories and the degradation or declining aspects of other theories. And so um, it's great to have you both here joining us um, from Australia, where they tell me there's just been a, uh, an election and um, it's been a very exciting weekend for everyone there in Sydney, Australia. It's uh, Monday morning there for them, Sunday evening for me, and we're glad to be able to, to come to all of you and talk about this paper. So, Stuart, Marco, do you want to start off by just giving me the sort of one-minute elevator pitch for what is this paper about? And you can each have a shot at it so that we get a sense of what are you putting forth here? Marco, you can go first. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Well... In a nutshell, this paper is about the social construction of uh, theory. So basically, understanding how a process of theorizing, not just as uh, this kind of a, a philosophical idea of uh, uh, the lone person in a room who comes up with uh, a beautiful idea that represents the world and explains the world in new ways, but understanding uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that... Uh, uh, is behind any theory. So the idea is that uh, when we theorize, we're never alone. We are always part of uh, a group of people who are with whom we, we converse, uh, we debate, uh, we fight, etc. And we build, uh, rather than a single theory, what uh, can be defined, uh, taking a leaf from uh, a famous uh, uh, Hungarian epistemologist, Imre Lakatos, uh, we build a research movement. So a group of people who are trying to Firm particular theory. And these research movements are forms of organizing. So ways of organizing the world, organizing our activities, organizing our way of thinking, organizing our way of doing research, and even organizing our way of uh, understanding the world. And since any form of organizing uh, involves uh, managing some tensions, some uh, uh, contradiction, even paradoxes, uh, our uh, idea was that uh, if we really want to understand why certain research movement, uh, example of research movement could be, uh, for instance, institutional theory or contingency theory uh, or any other, uh, say, large paradigmatic view about uh, management, well, understanding how it uh, grows, emerge, remain uh, kind of vibrant uh, and capable of adding new ideas, or in other cases, it tends to wither, it tends to lose momentum. And uh, we, our understanding, what we say in this paper, is fundamentally that it's the capacity to manage certain fundamental tensions and contradictions uh, and manage them effectively, what uh, makes uh, a research movement uh, uh, or what keeps a research movement alive and capable of producing good new theory. Wonderful, Marco. Thank you. What about your uh, one-minute elevator pitch there, Stuart? Okay, my one-minute elevator pitch would be that um, essentially knowledge is always constituted by power relations, and that power relations are essential to all aspects of the social constructions of reality, the social constructions of knowledge. So if we want to really understand why theories uh, thrive and, and, and die, we need to understand how effective they are uh, their, their, their theorists are in developing power with others and forming communities of practice, uh, developing co-citation uh, networks, uh, citation cartels, as we sometimes refer to them. 
and uh, that it's it's really to the politics of practice that we have to attend to be able to understand how theories uh, thrive and die. And this is important because there's so much nonsense, which is a kind of physics envy, which gets imported into organization and management theory, which has all sorts of illusions about the relationship between a reality and a theory which is supposed to correspond to it. And, you know, it's important to dispel those illusions to create some fresh air. And that is what I think our paper does. So who um, who's your audience for this paper? Who are you thinking of as sort of at least the, the people who are going to pick it up, read it, be excited about it initially? And then who might they pass it along to over time? And, and how might it be distributed beyond its initial core audience? Uh, I would think that there are two, in my view, there are two different audiences. On the one hand, an audience uh, of uh, experienced scholars, so fundamentally all the readers of uh, uh, academic management review and general academic management papers, who uh, might uh, be aware of these dynamics, but who are not always uh, completely reflective about those. So this is an invitation to be more reflective about the dynamics that are behind our theorizing. And the second audience instead is uh, uh, that in particular of new researchers, especially doctoral students. And the, 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 the intention is to remove a bit of the magic that is uh, uh, sometimes shrouding the, the, the theorizing process uh, and, the, and the creation of new ideas process uh, so that they become aware that it's not just a matter of, uh, again, coming up with uh, this spark of genius, but it's mostly a matter of being able to understand what type of conversation you want to join and why you're joining that conversation, uh, to what extent your own political, ideological, cultural affiliation uh, uh, influence you and influence other. It strikes me as as I read the paper that it's it really got quite a broad appeal compared to many AMR papers or other papers which would fit into a particular research movement as you've described them. This paper really takes a, a somewhat meta view or meta stance and and in some respects, almost anyone involved in scholarship or research, and certainly management and organization scholarship, should read this and, and appreciate some of the sort of underlying message of it if we want to better reflect on what we're doing as scholars. Would that be fair to say, Stuart, that this is relative to other papers has a, a fairly broad kind of reach and appeal? I think it does, and it, in, in part, if I may be a little uh, personal, I think that's part of my, my, my autobiography. I've been in the field for a very long time. Um, I'm a sociologist and I've always taken a sociological perspective on management. One of the earliest influences on me was uh, ethnomethodology, which I've uh, never lost sight of. And that's one reason why the quote at the beginning of the paper, that no canon, no collective, no institution, can go outside itself to a world of independent objects for criteria of knowledge, since there's no other way except by its own rules to describe what's being done with regard to knowledge by the late Peter McHugh, is I think a very important clue to what the paper is about. Now, coupled with that, I've been, a, I've been working in business school, well, not business schools, I've, I've been a sociology professor, a humanities professor, now I'm a professor in a project management uh, school, but I've, I've been working in the space of, of thinking and working on, on, on organizations of power for about 50 years. So I've seen, the, I've seen the, the, the fads and the fashions come and go. I've seen them wax and wane. I've seen the sort of uh, uh, fervent advocates of branches like contingency theory, uh, making very, very detailed uh, reasons why we should all be contingency theorists. And I've seen that the, 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 the plea, the call has not really been taken up. I've seen the way that uh, in a very short and rapid time, population ecologists through their co-citation cartels were able to quickly colonize the space in the administrative science quarterly and dominate the field. But I saw how rapidly that dominance disappeared and how institutional theory snuck in from the wings. So, you know, I, I think 
having this sort of seasoned scholar overview probably helped to contribute to, to the paper. Also, you know, my work hasn't changed much in 50 years in terms of its basic essentials. And there wasn't an audience for it when I started. And there is pretty large audience for it these days. It's not, I haven't changed, but the field has changed. And so I'm very aware of the ways in which that field has changed. Um, and of course, I, I'm, I'm a historical uh, organization theorist, so I, I love the history of the field. I mean, I love the history of many things, but uh, in this case, it was the history of the field. So in, in, in that respect, we sort of, as readers of this paper, get the benefit of, you, you said it, 50 years worth of experience and perspective, which becomes packaged up in sort of understanding uh, or developing an understanding of why certain things might stick from a theoretical standpoint and why certain things may um, disappear, may become less popular, may sort of lose traction and lose uh, impact, which, uh, which is really fascinating. And we'll get into the details of the paper and what some of the uh, issues at play are and some of the tensions or paradoxes that need to be navigated at play are in a moment. But before we get there, I'd just love to know how the two of you, um, plus your 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 co-author Miguel, came to sort of conceptualize of this paper. What's the backstory, and how did it evolve over time and come into being as a paper that's now uh, to be published, or, or it will be published in Academy of Management Review? I'll I'll, I'll take the lead on that one. It began uh, back in about mm, 2018, I think, when uh, uh, my my very good friend and frequent collaborator Miguel sent me a few jotted notes on a paper that had been published by um, uh, Maypura and Wilmot called Making a Niche, the Marketization of Management Research and the Rise of Knowledge Branding, a JMS paper. And it started out as a kind of little rejoinder to it, but um, we, 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 we originally developed a, a model which was um, a, a, a two by two of radical innovation, mimetic innovation, conservation and hegemonic incorporation as ways of uh, talking about which the, the ways in which the field would progress. Um, we lost that. And um, as, the, as the paper was, uh, was developing towards, uh, towards a, a, a paradox uh, view, uh, and Miguel, of course, is, uh, is, is a Paradox scholar, and so, of course, is, is, is Marco. So we thought, hey, let's get Marco involved as well. Marco and I worked together at that time in, in the University of Technology. In fact, Marco was a doctoral student of mine some, some years previously. So we, we, we've all worked together. There's a team of us, which is a little broader than the three of us, but uh, various, various uh, permutations of it can be found on, on, on various papers, and we... We have a very creative way of working together. The papers get swapped. Uh, Everything is done by the email because we're all in different time zones and continents. And we sort of build and layer the papers. And, and, and sometimes we get breakthroughs. And in this case, the breakthrough was, uh, was uh, with Marco, who uh, developed the, the model in uh, the, the representational model in, in the paper, which uh, began to pull it all together. And, and that went through several iterations as well. Maybe I hand over to Marco. So I just want to jump in there because you, you're starting to allude to a few interesting practices there. And then the number one, number one is sort of scribbling down a few notes, sharing them with a colleague and that creating some momentum. And, and that's, I think, valuable for anyone who wants to sort of get to grips with how do these things start? And so I, I love the, the fact that you sh shared that story. But then what I think is even more sort of triggering or pertinent is the fact that you had this, as you called it, a breakthrough that came through visual representation of some of those key ideas. So Marco, will you share with us a little bit about the sort of notion of visualizing some of these ideas and creating them into a figure that we'll, 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 we'll look at in a moment or we'll describe in a moment, but just the process of getting there and then the, the sort of evolution of that figure or that diagram over time. Well, well, in that, I have to say that I was able to build on my previous trade. So before becoming a full-time academic, which is something that uh, 
I did only a few years ago. I decided to do a PhD mostly because I really wanted to do it uh, with Stuart. I mean, Stuart <laughs> is the reason why I ended up uh, being an academic in the first place. Uh, I was a management consultant. So I've been working as a, as a management consultant for over 20 years before even considering uh, doing a PhD. Then I convinced uh, uh, Stuart uh, to take me up as a doctoral student. At first, it was very skeptical because uh, he couldn't understand how this loud-mouthed Italian uh, <laughs> wanted to become a sociologist or something like that. Something like that. But I was very persuasive. <laughs> and uh, and, um, and that, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship, I have to say, not just an academic collaboration. And the thing is, uh, I've always been used to connect the dots or trying to provide very simple representation, but which always maintain an element of uh, uh, dynamism. Uh, and I like, fundamentally, the idea is not just to create a figure that uh, captures in a uh, kind of a static way a reality, but rather something that uh, is thought-provoking that creates new possibilities and that uh, makes uh, enables the reader to project their own experience in that figure and think something else, something that goes beyond that figure. I think that is the key element that makes any visual representation useful. It's performative effect in a sense. So, and, and you refer to the notion of the performative nature of theorizing and what we do in the paper. And and, and we'll get to discussing some of that in a moment. And, and I'll pull up the figure that you've just been referring to, because it seems like that was a key sort of pivot point or, or um, uh, uh, development sort of aspect of, of bringing this to life. But before we do that, um, Stuart, can you just explain to us this idea of a research movement? And as, as, as opposed to, you, you know, I think a lot of us would think about a research program. And we all have our own research programs. But here we've got this notion of a research movement, which seems to have some link back or connection back with what I might think of as a social movement in, in, in a sociology standpoint. But here we're talking about it in a research context. And, and, and just for me, that, that was fresh, that was interesting and, and central to the paper. So I'd love to know how you would describe this idea of a research movement? I think I would describe it um, through, it's a community of practice which has um, institutional inscription. The, one, of, one of the homes in which research movements have been born, consolidated and developed is the European Group for Organization Studies, for instance with its annual conferences. Now, its conferences are very different, different from academy conferences. Academy conferences are sort of stars appear, people drift in and drift out. Um, normally, um, younger scholars get at the most maybe eight minutes in, in order to, to, to present their ideas. In EGOS, you spend uh, two and a half days working together with a whole group of scholars who are all interested in whatever substantive or theoretical topic is, uh, is in play. So this, this helps to build a research movement. Now, that research movement's partly based upon um, um, affinities which uh, emerge. People discover other people who are interested in the same things. It's partially built around, uh, hey, I didn't know that journal existed. It has a lot of great stuff in it that really interests me, and thank you very much for letting me know about it. It's partly about, um, oh, I haven't read that text. That's great. You know, that really, that really helps me crack this nut. So a research movement is, is, is it's an effective community of practice. It's an institutionally inscribed community of practice. And it's a community of practice in which people are active agents. So a research program sounds very different to me. A research program sounds like very serious <laughs> people developing research grants and unfolding everything under the hegemony or dominance of a, of a leading scholar. What I'm talking about, what we're talking about, is a much more co-active, co in Mary Parker Follett's wonderful phrase, a much more collaborative sort of process. And it, it typically it describes very much the process that 
Marco, Miguel and I and our various associates around the world with whom we, we, we regularly work. This is a reflexive account of theorizing because it's reflexive on the practices that we, are, we, we engage in ourselves. Awesome, thank you. Well, with that, I'm going to I'm going to pull up the, um, the the figure that is is part of the paper, and it just uh, Marco allow you to describe it and sort of unpack the elements of that figure in a little bit more detail. Okay, Marco. So here's the figure. Would you just mind walking us through what on earth is this figure telling us? Yes, certainly. So of course, at the center we have this idea of research movement, and as uh, Stuart was saying, uh, we, we specifically chose the word the movement over program because uh, it gives the idea of a grassroots, of a, of a bottom-up uh, sort of, and also emergent sort of uh, 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 construction, not just something that is planned uh, as in a program by a few minds. And the research movement, as I was mentioning before, is a form of organizing. And this organizing is based on four fundamental uh, pillars, if you want. First of all, there is a particular way of uh, thinking, particular way of uh, uh, conceptualizing. Some research movements are more qualitative, for instance, others are a bit more quantitative in terms of uh, they tend, or to use another uh, classic, uh, um, say, say just proposition of contraposition of, of possibilities, some are more process-oriented, uh, others tend to be more variance-based uh, in, in the sense of trying to understand how one variable uh, produces changes in another variable of whatever phenomenon we are observing. So, full style, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, kind of give uh, coherence to the way of thinking in a particular movement. Then on the, on another fundamental element is the particular grammar, so the way of talking about research, the way of talking about uh, presenting uh, uh, studies. And this grammar also incorporates certain taken-for-granted assumptions. I mean, all theory is bound by our assumptions, and, and some of these assumptions become uh, hidden in the way in which we are talking about. I mean, Greg, you are an entrepreneurship uh, scholar, and for instance, the typical assumption of entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurship is good, and it's a, a force for change, a, for a, a vital uh, Force. And we know instead that sometimes entrepreneurship can be not always a force for good, that there are also examples of uh, antisocial entrepreneurship and so forth. Then there is a, a very practical, hands-on aspect of any form of theorizing and doing research, which is the empirics. Again, even if in, th in theory, theoretically, we keep, uh, when we publish or we write something for AMR, uh, apparently we, we keep at an arm's length from empirics, still with our theorizing, we make certain forms of uh, inquiry of uh, heuristics possible, or we uh, steer away from others. So again, the empirics will have a, an important uh, role in shaping our research movement. And then finally, I hope that most of the uh, American audience won't uh, uh, try to, uh, to, to flee uh, screaming when they read actor networks. But the idea of actor networks is a, is a very European, French uh, um, take on, uh, on the way in which society is, is, is built. Uh, the idea that whatever we do is a kind of a social material assemblage, so incorporates way of talking, way of speaking, way of thinking, but also material elements things. And as an example of these social material assemblage are conferences. Uh, before Stuart was talking about uh, the, the different role that different settings of conferences, egos versus academy of management, uh, produces. So uh, each different type of setting, different types of uh, ways of coming together, for instance, uh, create different opportunities. But also in these social material actor network assemblage, there are also particular uh, university departments, so physical places where people meet, or even, uh, even possibly now, the fact that we do most of our meetings and research uh, uh, via Zoom, even that might uh, play a role in our way of producing or assembling knowledge. And uh, on top of these four pillars, uh, I mean, these are the, the things that we need to do in order to sustain or even uh, perform a research movement. But uh, some specific, uh, say, uh, practices emerge at the, interact at the intersection 
of these different pillars. So, for instance, between thought styles and heuristic regulation, there is a particular intellectual craft. Uh, sorry, sorry, between uh, uh, thought style and grammars, there is an intellectual craft, a particular way of disciplining our way of thinking in relation to a particular research movement. Or between empirics and uh, actor networks, uh, there is uh, a practice of research impact. How do we demonstrate our impact uh, on how we can, which is fundamental for asking for further support uh, from our, uh, for instance, faculties, etc. And uh, each of these practices involves managing some tensions, some uh, contradictions that might turn into paradoxes. So situations where the, co the contradiction is so interdependent and so opposite that makes the situation persistent, that makes the situation almost undecidable. So, for instance, the issue of, uh, say, take another one, uh, the, the, the need to keep this community together, this community of different intellectuals and researchers together, uh, which emerge at the intersection between the thought style and the actor networks, the conferences and the way of thinking, well, there is a problem of keeping this community, this research movement open so that new people can be uh, recruited, new ideas can be brought in, but at the same time, not so open that it will disperse, it would fragment in many different sub-movements or sub-ideas. So we need to keep this community both vital and open and bound and, say, controlled. And the same applies to all the other, uh, say, contradictions and, and paradoxes. So it's in navigating these paradoxes between openness and closure, novelty and continuity, representation and performity, rigor and applicability, that this idea becomes much more sort of dynamic and um, ongoing as opposed to just a static representation of what we might see as sort of a domain of research. At least that's how I interpreted it. Number one, you were able to identify the aspects that are sort of central to organizing a research movement, being community boundedness, intellectual craft, managing or regulating heuristics and, and sort of specifying what might count as research impact. But then even beyond that and specifying those sort of organizing attributes, you really highlight these paradoxes or tensions that need to be navigated. Um, Stuart, I'd love to know, how did you get to that point of the sort of paradoxical tension that needs to be navigated because to me that's where the thing suddenly the, the 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 ideas in this paper suddenly become well I I I I wouldn't have gone that far or thought about it in it with that level of depth or dynamism so um you know when 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 we when we see a a, a paper published in AMR we don't always know the sort of battles that have gone to get to that point or the breakthrough that might have led to that point. And to me, that's one of the, the things that certainly go beyond what others have said in the past. So I'd love to know what allowed you to arrive at these sort of paradoxes that need to be navigated within these sort of organizing attributes. Okay, well, firstly, we're, we're all involved Miguel, Marco, and I, one way or another, in paradox scholarship, a, a little community of practice that's grown quite markedly in, in recent years. Secondly, um, contradictions are the spice of life. And um, I've been interested in contradictions all my life. And uh, I, I've, I've, I've tried to practice contradictory things as, uh, as often as possible. I, I find it engaging to, um, to, pose, to pose puzzles and uh, to not to be stereotyped in my thinking or, or, or the ways in which I work. The, the, there are two elements going on in, in the diagram, which M M Marco's done a great job of, of, of capturing from the text that we produced. And, and this, this became the representation or the visualization device for the text. Firstly, there's a sort of deep embeddedness in theories. So, you know, we, M Marco and I are, are both, um, both fairly well embedded in actor network theory, which I, I, interestingly, almost all these theories are, are, have a European origin, which, uh, which Marco, Marco referred to. 
So we're very familiar with the work that people like Latour and Calon and, 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 and others have done. I've recently written a paper with Danielle Logue and John Gray about Mary Douglas. And Mary Douglas was the popularizer of the idea of thought styles in anthropology. So I was able to draw on that, uh, that background uh, knowledge of uh, this concept of thought styles that uh, Mary Douglas had done such an, in, an important job of uh, pushing into uh, social science mainstream. And all my life, I've been interested in um, philosophy of science questions. And, and that meant that I was very familiar with Wittgenstein. And, and in Wittgenstein, the notion of grammars is, is an extremely important concept, as well as in other theorists as well, uh, Burke and others. So, um, you know, we, 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 had, we had the pillars uh, well down and we were inclined to think in terms of paradoxes. So it was, it was really just a juggling act and it, it took a little bit of juggling, but uh, eventually this is, this is how the, um, the, 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 the juggling fell out. Um, I think it's really important to maintain tension in theorizing. I've always, I don't know if Marco will remember this, but when he did a subject with me, a, a research subject called doing exemplary research, I always stress the importance of not working with a theory, but working with theories. Of, of searching for the contradictions between them, of maintaining tension, because I believe it's out of those contradictions, out of those tensions, that creativity and innovation flows. So a lot of that is, is, is embedded in, in the paper. Awesome, thank you. So what did, the, what did the reviewers tell you? I mean, what was that process of sending this up uh, or, or you obviously submitted it, you got some reviews back. How did it evolve through the review process? What did you find somewhat challenging there? Marco, maybe what did you learn through that? Um, and, uh, and, and, and how did the paper evolve as a result of that? One of the things we know from our audience is that many of them have not submitted to the Academy of Management Review before. Um, or may have submitted and had papers rejected even in the review process. So you obviously managed to navigate through this process. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Greg, I, I have to say that uh, I am the greatest fan of the, the review process at the Academy of Management Review. Uh, I, I can tell that because, uh, well, on the one hand, I've been very successful at publishing in Academy of Management the Review, because I've already published uh, four papers uh, there, and I've got two more uh, under review, uh, and and I'm I'm very hopeful about the possibility of publication of those two. And uh, uh, the reason why I'm a fan of the process, not because I've been successful, but rather because uh, uh, of how much I've learned uh, every time uh, I've been submitting a paper uh, to AMR, because the uh, the reviewers. Uh, are never behaving as uh, gatekeepers. They're always behaving as a sort of non-credited uh, co-authors in the sense that they always provide the idea. In this case, uh, it's interesting. I mean, there is a fundamental principle that needs to be maintained. It's not that they are everyone. So I'm not, I don't want to advocate for people to just send whatever is your half-baked idea at AMR, and uh, it will turn into a fantastic paper thanks to the reviewers, because uh, I think it's much more likely they will be desk rejected. The point is that if the idea is strong, the core idea is strong enough, and in this case, I saw immediately an incredibly strong idea in the original uh, idea that was um, foreshadowed by, by Stuart and Miguel, and if it's presented with sufficient uh, clarity, then the reviewers will always push back in a very constructive way, push back in the sense of uh, forcing us to clarify what we mean or uh, be a bit more consistent in our presentation and so forth. So at the beginning of this paper was all about uh, what is the role, what is the role of power in establishing a knowledge brand, which was a super interesting topic, but uh, uh, maybe to a topic that would have been better served with uh, some form of empirical investigation. Because otherwise, it would be a number of statements uh, that could be seen as very controversial by this or that uh, scholar. And uh, 
the need to theorize about this. Uh, the, 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 what what the reviewers pushed us back, and both the editors. We had two editors. First was Udo Zander, and then uh, Jay Barney, uh, because Udo unfortunately couldn't uh, uh, keep up with being an editor for personal issues, and so he passed the baton to to Jay, who actually, and it was a quite seamless process because. Uh, Actually, it was like having another uh, idea, set of coherent ideas that uh, pushed up forward. And the thing is, uh, uh, we needed to really uh, understand or reflect deeply on the characteristics of the theorizing process. For instance, something that the, the reviewers pushed us into doing, and uh, something that I did personally, was to actually look in detail at everything that had been written about theorizing in AMR, but also in other journals, to understand where there were commonality and things. And what uh, emerged from that systematic uh, analysis, and there is no trace of the systematic review, I mean, because we, did, we, we kept it all on the background, but was this idea that a number of ideas that we have in that we have encapsulated in our model uh, were not original. People were aware of those, but it almost as if uh, they were a thread of uh, kind of uh, speaking uh, this idea out loud because uh, the, the the central idea was oh, but we are not really willing to talk about our political squabbles in the background, our tensions, etc. It's all about presenting a very neat, a very clear, uh, say, fruit of our ponderings. And instead, we thought it was really important to reveal these uh, kind of tensions that were agitating. So again, our tensions uh, in relation with the reviewers were pushing us to be clearer and to uh, reveal the mechanisms, not just to state them, uh, helped us immensely in clarifying our own uh, thinking. Awesome, and thank you for the positive feedback, um, at least from the from the journal's perspective on that review process. It is a, a a high priority for everyone involved to provide developmental reviews, and I'm glad to to hear that you've had such such success. Um, that's an attribute to you and the quality of work that you submit, because. Not everything does land up getting through, but we always do try and be constructive. So, Stuart, you alluded to a little earlier, or Marco might have alluded to your management and organization theory class um, that you teach or seminar that you uh, provide. Um, where would this paper fit within that and how would you set it up within that alongside maybe other papers or other points of discussion? I'd love to know. You know, so the next time you put this seminar together, where are you going to use this and how are you going to use this? That's a good question. Um, the class, the class in question was prompted by the publication of uh, a book by a couple of friends of mine back in the 1990s, early 1990s, um, Peter Frost and, and Ralph Stabley, both of whom sadly are no longer with us. They, they published a book called Doing Exemplary Research and they they, they sampled uh, opinion from the OMT division of the academy as to what, uh, in, in, in the period in which they were preparing the book, they thought were relatively recently published papers that looked to be exemplary and um, uh, ones that they thought would, you know, last more than a, a short season. So they, they ended up with, I think, about seven of these different uh, exemplary papers. And very, very cleverly, rather than just republishing the papers, what they did in the book was to get the authors to reflect on the research journey, the editors and reviewers of the, uh, the papers to do so. Well, maybe I, I, I think it's a great shame that that book never had a second edition to update it with more, more recent material. I've always found it a wonderful pedagogical device because what I ask students to do is to then come and defend their exemplar for doing their research. So it, it really it really becomes a very practical form of instruction. Well, I would hope that our paper might become an exemplar and that it might uh, it might at some time in the future function as an exemplar in uh, in in some other venture 
somewhat similar or taking taking on the mantle from the uh, the frost and stab line uh, volume i think it has a lot of potential to do that because it has a lot of tensions and 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 openings uh, in in the paper um just to go back to the re to, to to the previous discussion with Marco, just there's just one thing I'd like to mention. We had one one reviewer who really didn't get it, and um, he or she, I don't know who the person was. Obviously, the reviews are always blind. Basically, had a, a very very correspondence view of reality. There's reality. And the job is to get a model that corresponds to it, and uh, you know what's the problem? We don't need all this fancy theoretical work going on that uh, that you're talking about all this politics and paradoxes and you know thought styles and so on yeah. my initial my initial response to this was to feel that this was a little i thought it's somewhat naive let me say and uh, but um whether it was or it was not, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it came from a sophisticated grasp of a position that I simply don't find terribly you know, convincing. It did force us to try and uh, address what that person uh, had expressed quite clearly as an antipathy to what we were doing. So it's not always just the supportive reviews, the, 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 the developmental reviews. It's sometimes the ones that don't get it and show that they don't get it, which are, which are really important in developing the paper. And I think that um, viewers of this uh, need to know that because uh, it can be very dispiriting. You can be really put off by a review like that, but you have to fight back. And uh, you have to fight back courteously, rationally. You have to give explanations. You have to show... You know, you're starting from assumptions that people can follow. You go through moves in the argument that everybody can accept to get to conclusions that they can't deny. And, and that's the essence of the rationality of the, the, the responding to review process. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful paper, um, Research Movements and Theorizing Dynamics in Management and Organization Studies. Really helps us step back think about sort of uh, process and, and, and conceptualize what's really going on when a theory is, number one, gaining traction, number, number two, getting more and more momentum and more and more people buying in, and number three, and even more importantly, when it's sort of starting to fall by the wayside and be ignored and no one's paying any attention. And, and, and so it's, um, it, it really helps a better position the world that I think all of us as scholars are operating on an ongoing basis, uh, a, a world that's uh, uh, got lots of social relations, a world that relies on language, a world that needs to relate back to the empirics of what's going on and, 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 and is centered around this idea of community. So thank you for writing it. I'd like to end off with... Um, with, with one a question for each of you, and that's what advice would you give to someone who hasn't yet published in AMR, is trying to, num number one, conceive of and develop an idea that they could get into AMR, and, um, and just, you know, what are your takeaways from having done it a number of times, and, um, and certainly, uh, if you reflect on this project and something that you think um, would empower someone who's 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 trying to do this, who's trying to learn to do it for the first time, or um, has submitted and had something rejected, maybe feeling a little bit defeated by all of that, just in terms of the concept of being able to contribute to theory and potentially be part of one of these research movements that you've described in a meaningful way. So just a few words of uh, advice in parting to someone who wants to contribute to a research movement through writing a conceptual paper. Well, uh, not, not, not easy. Uh, I would say that the three uh, are the major things uh, that pops to my mind. The first one, uh, it's... Uh, if you really want to do some uh, theorizing that can be published uh, in academic management review, 
you really need to go beyond simply trying to uh, say clarify some points or some definition, etc. You need to be a bit bolder, and the best way to be bold, I think, is to question the assumptions on which the current theory is based. So take a theory and then, and then ask yourself, well, what are the things that uh, whoever wrote this theory takes for granted? What are the assumptions? And we all need to have some assumptions on which to base our theory. And uh, if you can think of uh, how things could be otherwise, what are alternative assumptions that could be useful to, uh, again, uh, reconsider the phenomenon or reconsider that uh, intellectual building, then go for it and see where it takes you. Second element, uh, never do it alone. I mean, there are a few amazing scholars who are able to produce theory by themselves. I mean, Stuart did one of those. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 it's something that I really would not advise because, again, the best theory comes out and the best research comes out of collaboration and discussion and debate. So try as much as possible to work with others. And, and Marco, third, just, uh, to, inter Marco, just yeah. to interject there, because I've been, I've been bumping into this, certainly the first time you're going to try and submit to AMR or write a conceptual paper, do it with somebody else. Um, and and we, yeah. I've seen people try and do it themselves the very first time, get rejected, feel defeated, and there's something there, but there's, it, it, there is a, a, a value that comes through the debate, the discussion, the interaction with someone else, particularly if it's someone who, who's a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more experienced that can help navigate that process. So I just want to double click on that, that second point of advice. Oh, de de definitely. We're definitely on the same page on that. Uh, also, it helps with the third elements. I mean, the management of emotions. I mean, I think you really need to be very passionate about something. However, there is, again, a paradoxical relationship because if you are too passionate about something, then you become very defensive and you, and you will reject any sort of criticism. But I think that a good way to navigate that is to have a co-author who might be less passionate about that particular point and can help you to kind of reinterpret the pushing back or the criticism of the reviewers in a different way and maybe... Uh, take on where you like. So I think these are the three elements. Uh, first thing, uh, problematize, uh, as Albus and Spicer would say. Uh, second, try to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, embrace uh, uh, collaboration. And third, uh, manage your emotion in a positive sense, leverage on your emotion, but also don't be carried away by those. Thank you. Stuart, what would you give as uh, a few little words of advice to someone? That yeah, I, I, I think it's very important. Um, I think the most important part of the paper is the introduction. And you, you, you really should have a look at some AMR introductions. There's a certain style. It's a very North American style. It's, uh, it's, it's shorter, sharper sentences. There's no long sentences with lots of subordinate clauses. So the first thing you must do is sort of edit what your stream of consciousness might be so that it begins to be crisper. Secondly, you have to really think of the key words that you want to elaborate. You must position your, the significance of what you're doing and you must position the contribution that you're making. And you must do all of this in about five paragraphs. And in your last paragraph, you should say what it is you're going to do, and in the rest of the part, paper, you should do it. So I think those are probably really, really important aspects. I think a secondary aspect, thinking about my experience with the AMR papers that, that I've published is, it really does help if you have um, a, a representational device that pulls the argument together somewhere, because it A, helps focus your energies as a, as a writer and collaborator, on making things as clear as possible, and that helps to make things as clear as possible for the reader. So uh, I, I think I think those are probably the the major takeaways. Oh, and the third the third major takeaway is always respond to everything that the reviewers have to say, and to to make it really really clear, 
you can actually end up writing a response which is longer than the paper because you probably are going to, rather than leave it to them to go and look at what you've done in the paper, I think it makes a lot of sense to actually put in quotes or italics or whatever, the changes that you've made in the paper so that they can see in the response letter that the issue that they had with the paper has been thoughtfully addressed to, uh, has been thoughtfully addressed, and this is how it has been addressed. So one of the things I would do is always, however the reviewer's response and the editor's responses might be, I would enumerate every, what I think is every single substantive point that's being made. And then I'd construct a two-fold table with the um, the, the substantive points numbered on the left side, and then on the right side, I would make sure that the team uh, covered every one of those points so that every point was nailed down. Now, that might not be how you present your response because you'd be working through Manuscript Central or some other thing which won't accept that, that form of, 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 of data. I mean, it is a form of data. It's, 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 it's using, it's using a, a visual form to, to help you do an exercise. But um, you can re re recalibrate it so that it fits, fits in there. But I think it's a really important uh, interim step because it basically means don't give them an inch, you know, cover every, 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 every point. Don't let the bastards get you down. Uh, don't let them screw you at the last minute. So it's, it's your responsibility as authors to ensure that this doesn't happen. You're engaged in a combative game, you know. Getting published in journals is a combative sport, and uh, you have to play the game well. Well, thank you. You've certainly played the game well in this case. It's a great paper. I recommend everyone get their hands on it, read it, think about what research movement you're part of, what roles you're playing in that movement with regards to community and with regards to um, language and with regards to everything that you're doing. And thank you to, for the, to the two of you for uh, getting up so early on a Monday morning to talk with me, share with me your perspectives, and in particular for these words of advice towards the end. Just a few comments on that for our listeners. Um, uh, Marco referred to the importance of assumptions and creating some tension within those assumptions or some um, perspective on those assumptions. We are going to, within the Academy of Management Review, have a from the editors about that coming up in, in, in a few, few months or maybe even a year's time. So that's all on the cards. We've also got one coming up, which is already sort of uh, about to be in press on managing your emotions, which was your third point. Um, we've, there's a, there are already great uh, from the editors, one by Jay Barney, um, on writing good introductions, which relates to what uh, Stuart referred to. And you've given us some good, good ideas for other ones we may write on collaboration and on visualization of different things. So thank you for those perspectives. Um, and, and we've also got some, some good, we've got a good from the editors on, on responding to reviewers, which is part of what Stuart said. So you use this as the gateway into learning more about these critical things that can help uh, manage the process of theorizing, manage the process of publishing theory. Thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you to the two of you for participating so actively and eagerly. We appreciate it.